morning friends oh you bards of the twenties painting your pictures of their bright and bubbling happiness even those who touched only their farthest edge who touched them only in childhood will never forget them and those plug uglies those fat faces busy persecuting engineers in the twenties too they ate their bellies full and now we see also that they had been busy from 1918 on in the two trials following we will take leave of our favorite supreme accuser for a while he is occupied with his preparations for the major trial of the SRs. This spectacular, spectacular trial aroused a great deal of emotion in Europe beforehand, and the People's Commissariat of Justice was suddenly taken aback. After all, we had been trying people for four years without any code, neither a new one nor an old one, and in all probability Kurlenko himself was concerned about the code too. Everything had to be neatly tied up ahead of time. The coming church trials were internal. They didn't interest progressive Europe, and they could be and they could be conducted without a code. We have already had an opportunity to observe that the separation of church and state was so construed by the state that the churches themselves and everything that hung in them was installed in them and painted in them belonged to the state, and the only church remaining was that church which, in accordance with the scriptures, lay within the heart. <laughs> And in 1918, when political victory seemed to have been attained faster and more easily than had been expected, they had, they had pressed right on to confiscate church property. However, this leap had aroused too, too fierce a wave of popular indignation. In the heat of the Civil War, it was not very intelligent to create, in addition, an eternal front against the believers, and it proved necessary to postpone for the time being the, di for the, time being the dialogue between the Communists and the Christians. At the end of the Civil War, and as its natural consequence, an unprecedented famine developed in the Volga area. They give it only two lines in the official histories because it doesn't add a very ornamental touch to the wreaths of the victors in that war. But the, common, the famine existed nonetheless to the point of cannibalism, to the point at which parents ate their own children. Such a famine as even Russia had never known, even in the time and troubles in the early 17th century, because at that time, as the historians testify, unthreshed ricks of grain survived intact be beneath the snow and ice for several years. Just one film about famine might throw a new light on everything we saw and everything we know about the revolutions and the Civil War. But there are no films, and no novels, and no statistical research. The effort is to forget it. It does not embellish. Besides, we have come to blame the kulaks as the cause of the famine. And just who were the kulaks in the midst of such collective death? B.G. Korolenko, in his letters to Lunacharsky, Lunacharsky, which, despite Lunacharsky's promise, were never officially published in the Soviet Union, explains to us Russia's total epidemic descent into famine and destitution. It was the result of, product of productively having been reduced to zero the working hands were all carrying guns, and the result also of the peasants' utter lack of trust and hope that even the smallest part of the harvest might be left for them. Yes, and some day someone will also count up those many carloads of food supplies rolling on and on for many, many months to Imperial Germany under the terms of the peace treaty of Brest-Litovsk. -Lit from a Russia which had been deprived of a protesting voice, from the various provinces where famines would strike, so that Germany could fight to the end in the West. There was a direct, immediate chain of cause and effect. The Volga peasants had to eat their children because they were so impatient about putting up with the constituent assembly. But political, political genius lies in extracting success even from the people's ruin. A brilliant idea was born. After all, three billiard balls can be pocketed with one shot. So now let the priests feed the Volga region. They are Christians. They are generous. One, if they refuse, we will blame the whole famine on them and destroy the church. <laughs> Two, if they agree, we will clean out the churches. Three, in either case, we will replenish our stocks of foreign exchange and precious metals. Yes, and the idea of, was probably inspired by the actions of the church itself. As Patriarch Tikhon himself had testified back in August 1921, at the beginning of the famine, the church had created diocesan Diocesan and all Russian committees for aid to the starving had begun to collect funds. But to have permitted any direct help to go straight from the church into the mouths of those who were starving would have undermined the dictatorship of the proletariat. The committees were banned, and the funds they had collected were confiscated and turned over to the state treasury. 
The patriarch had also appealed to the Pope in Rome and to the Archbishop of Canterbury for assistance, but he was rebuked for this, too, on the grounds that only the Soviet authorities had the right to enter into discussions with foreigners. Yes, indeed. And what was there to be alarmed about? The newspapers wrote that the government itself had all the necessary means to cope with the famine. Meanwhile, in the Volga region, they were eating grass, the soles of shoes, and gnawing at door jams. And finally, in December 1921, Palmgall, the State Commission for Famine Relief, proposed that the churches help the starving by donating church valuables, not all, but those not required for liturgical rites. The patriarch agreed. Palmgall issued a directive. All gifts must be strictly voluntary. In February 19, 1922, the Patriarch issued a pastoral letter permitting the parish councils to make gifts of objects that did, that did not have liturgical and ritual significance. And in this way, matters could again have simply degenerated into, com into a compromise that would have frustrated the will of the proletariat, just as it once had been by the Constituent Assembly, and still was in all the chatterbox European parliaments. The thought came in a stroke of lightning. The thought came and a decree followed. A decree of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee on February 26th, all valuables, valuables were to be requisitioned from the churches for the starving. The patriarch wrote to Kalinin, who did not reply. Then on February 28th, the patriarch issued a new fateful pastoral letter. From the church's point of view, such a measure is sacrilege, and we cannot approve the requisition. From the distance of a half century, it is easy to reproach the patriarch, of course, the leaders of the Christian Church ought not to have been distracted by wondering whether other resources might not be available to the Soviet government, and who it was who had driven the Volga to famine. They ought not to have clung to those treasures, since the possibility of a new fortress of faith, or, since the possibility of a new fortress of faith ar arising, if it existed at all, did not depend on them. But one has also to picture the situation of that unfortunate patriarch not elected to his post until after the October Revolution, who had for a few short years led a church that was always persecuted, restricted, under fire, and whose preservation had been entrusted to him. But right then and there, a surefire campaign of persecution began in the papers, directed against the patriarch and the high church authorities who were strangling the Volga region with the bony hand of famine. And the more firmly the patriarch clung to his position, the weaker it became. In March, a movement to relinquish the valuables, to come to an agreement with the government, began even among the clergy. Their still undispelled qualms were expressed to Kalinin by Bishop and Antonin Granovsky, a member of the Central Committee of Palmgall. The believers feared that the church valuables may be used for other purposes more limited and alien to their hearts. Knowing the general principles of our progressive doctrine, the experienced reader will agree that this was indeed very probable. After all, the common turn's needs and those of the East in the course of being liberated were no less acute than those of the Volga. The Petrograd metropolitan Veniamin was similarly, similarly impelled by a mood of trust. This belongs to God, and we will give all, all of it by ourselves. But forced requisitions were wrong. Let the sacrifice be of our own free will. He, too, wanted verification by the clergy and the believers— to watch over the church valuables up to the very moment when they were transformed into bread for the starving. And in all this he was tormented, lest he violate the censoring will of the patriarch. In Petrograd, things seemed to be working out peacefully. The atmosphere at the session of the Petrograd Palm Gallen on March 5, 1922, was even joyful, according to the testimony of an eyewitness. Benjamin announced, The Orthodox Church is prepared to give everything to help the starving saw sacrilege only in forced requisition. But in that case, requisition was unnecessary. Konotchikov, chairman of the Petrograd Palm, Petrograd Palmgall, gave his assurance that this would produce a favorable attitude toward the church on the part of the Soviet government. Not very likely, that. In a burst of good feeling, everyone stood up. The Metropolitan said, the heaviest burden is division and enmity. But the time will come when the Russian people will unite. I myself, at the head of the worshippers, will remove the cover of precious metals and precious stones from the icon of the Holy Virgin of Kazan. I will sh shed sweet tears on it and give it away. He gave his blessing to the Bolshevik members of Palmgall, and they saw him to the door with bared heads. The newspaper, Petrogradskaya Pravda, 
in its issues of March 8, 9, and 10, confirmed the peaceful, successful outcome of the talks and spoke favorably, favorably of the Metropolitan. In Smolny, they agreed that the church vessels and icon coverings would be melted down to ingots in the presence of the believers. Again, things were getting fouled up by some kind of compromise. The noxious fumes of Christianity were poisoning the revolutionary will. What kind of unity and that way of hand, handing over the valuables were not what the starving people of the Volga needed. The spineless membership of the Petrograd Palmgall was changed. The newspapers began to howl about the evil pastors and princes of the church, and the representatives of the church who were told, We don't need your donations, and there won't be any negotiations with you. Everything belongs to the government, and the government will take whatever it considers necessary. And so forcible requisitions accompanied by strife began in Petrograd. And they did everywhere else, as they did everywhere else. And this provided the legal basis for initiating trials of the clergy. Have a good day, friends.